We start things off with the Sicko Satchel taking your questions and, of course, the YouTube comments section. And then we'll finish our thoughts on the summer games we've seen so far before tonight's game against the Pelicans. All today on Locked On Hornets. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz, we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free. We are available anywhere you get your pods. If you check us out on YouTube, then you will see for the second time this week, Doug and I color coordinated our T-shirt. Now, hey, shirt thing, brother. Doug, now, Doug will see me when we're talking back and forth pre-show, but I can't see him. He often has me on a different screen or I'm just looking at myself. So did you not realize it until the screens, the dueling screens, showed us beside each other wearing the same color? Uh, listen, I'm very busy this morning. I'm looking at this New Orleans Pelicans summer league roster. I saw that they have Jalen Crutcher <laughs> now. That threw me oh, no. off a little bit. I've got, I'm working on some stats stuff for everyhornetsboxscore.com. I'm just buried in statistics right now. So listen, I got a lot going on. So no, I'm sorry. I wasn't looking at what color your t-shirt you had on until you came on the screen for real, for real. All right, anyway. that's Doug Branson. You can check his workout on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com, and you can listen to me every weekday on Sports Radio 927 W. Now, how often does that happen between you and uh, Wes? It doesn't happen. Wes has um, some pretty fire outfits that he'll wear. Well, and and T-shirts, you know, all across the board. Sometimes I'll wear my wild graphic, not graphic tees, but like my Muggsy Bogues or Glenn Rice shirt. I'll hornets mm -hmm. it up a little bit. Had a Scotty Pippen shirt on the other day. Um, but we don't really have the same T-shirt problem. That's we good. don't do that. That's good. But like we do put it out on Twitter, that. though, some of the fire that we'll both wear. Sometimes that does happen. Um, this is pretty fire, right in your face fire with all these red shirts. All right, let's go to the Sicko Satchel. It's enough outfit talk, okay? Get out of here, outfits. Let's talk about Sicko Satchel questions that you have for me, Doug. What do you want to lead off the show with? Uh, the Sicko Satchel, for those uh, that are just joining us, uh, that's our, our Q&A, our mailbag. It's for the Sickos, the people uh, that for some reason are still believing that this team uh, will figure it all out. Maybe after a new ownership group and a new front office, they'll figure some stuff out. And one of the things that they have to figure out, I think, is ultimately this wing rotation, both in the short term and the long term. And we had a lot of sickos in the satchel asking about Terry Rozier, a lot of different versions of how much time uh, is left in Terry's career with the Charlotte Hornets. What kind of trade value can you get? Uh, this is Tyler saying, if we were to trade Terry, what package do you think we could put together? What kind of tra trade package do you think we could get in return? Love having Terry on the team, but now is the best time to move on from him before the trade deadline. So, Walker, do you think that the Hornets will trade Terry Rozier, I mean, significantly before the deadline? Um, I don't think so. I don't think significantly before the deadline, just because we've already gone through draft night, which is a nice catalyst to breed deals. And it didn't happen there is in the next one would be getting closer to the deadline. So maybe once we get to that mid season point, Terry Rozier is gone. I don't think it's going to be significantly before the deadline. They decide to move on him now at this past deadline, Doug, we all knew the Terry Rozier rumors. They were ramping up. Rumors were that there were some interested teams, but there wasn't a deal that was able to get done. I do think it used to be Gordon Hayward's contract because he was making over $30 million. This would have been a couple of years ago mm -hmm. where that was the most, that was probably the worst because of his availability, but he was a good player on the court. So mm -hmm. it was always kind of hard to gauge what a team thought about Gordon. I think you're in that same realm here with Terry, but Terry Rozier's contract is now probably the hardest to trade. Because one, Gordon Hayward, now you're in that weird area where it might even be advantageous for you to go ahead and trade for his contract. It's an expiring and you free up $30 million. LaMelo Ball, you want his contract because you want the player. So LaMelo clearly isn't that. And then everybody else, I mean, nobody else is on a long-term deal. So Terry's going to be the hardest guy to trade, uh, in my opinion, at least getting some real value in return. Yeah, the CBA, the new CBA that hasn't taken effect yet, but is influencing decisions on the marketplace because it introduces this new tax apron that essentially if you get to a certain level, you're going to get penalized. And then if you get to another level, you're going to get ultra penalized. 
a lot of teams that I think would have been interested in Terry Rozier's services uh, may have balked at the contract number because of that. So they introduced those new CBA rules uh, to help teams like the Charlotte Hornets compete in the long term, compete for players that ultimately would have been vacuumed up by the Golden States and the Milwaukee's, you know, these waiver wire guys that, you know, all of a sudden uh, end up on these championship contending teams. Now, some of the lower rung playoff teams may be able to compete on the market for those services. But in the short term, it hurts anyone who had one of these contracts that's a that's a little bit dicier. So the Hornets are probably going to have to work through a lot of this stuff on their books and then con- and make good decisions moving forward. So I, I agree with you, Walker. I don't think that it happens uh, until we get closer to the deadline. That, go ahead. Well, one, well, just one other point for me. With Terry Rozier, remember we were talking about at the deadline this past season, man, his numbers were so down. So then we were discussing maybe yeah. it is better for the Hornets to wait until, let's say, Terry has a hot two months to the start of the season, and you're hoping for that. And instead he moves off of the 33% three-point shooting and 42% overall field goal percent, 41.5, right? Those numbers are worse than they were the previous two years. So now you have a contract where you have a lot of years left on it still. You're paying a premium and you're paying a lot of money. It's not a max, but you're paying a lot of money and the numbers aren't good. So yeah. maybe this, these first two months of the season, whatever, the numbers, honestly, it's it's almost in that territory for him with the territory, if you will. It's almost in that territory where <laughs> the numbers can't help but go up. I mean, I don't expect him to shoot that poorly again, especially with guys coming back to the roster. I don't have my soundboard loaded right now, but I'll make sure to get a, a little EC laugh. Eric Collins laughing there for I appreciate territory. That. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was good on the fly. Um, okay, I, I agree with all that. Um, I think uh, with, with Terry Rozier, and, you know, part of the reason his numbers were down last season was because he was being asked to play point guard, yeah, you know, and do a lot for a team that didn't have a lot of guard help. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed Walker, but they still haven't signed a backup point guard. They've got T- uh, Teo Maladone, James Brooke Knight, free- yeah, even Nick Smith jr. There they'll facilitate facilitate. Oh, they're fine. No, it's we've seen good. that. We've we, maybe if you, <laughs> if summer league didn't exist, you might've been able to sell me on that, but I've seen what <laughs> Nick Smith jr. And James Book and I do when they're not trying to score for themselves. And it's 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 pretty much bupkis. It might be worse than bupkis. It might be mm. sub bupkis, subkis, if you will, uh, because they're turning the basketball over. So uh, they, they need to get some guard help to make sure that Terry Rozier can actually play shooting guard. But some of the other questions in the sicko satchel reg- regarded Terry Rozier's future at the shooting guard position. And some of them were, will Nick Smith Jr. start over Terry? Will Brandon Miller start over Terry Rozier? What are the chances that we see Terry Rozier move to a bench role this season in favor of Brandon Miller at the two or Nick Smith Jr. at the two? Well, I mean, Nick Smith Jr. is not happening. I would be shocked. I would be, I'd be pretty surprised about Brandon Miller starting at the two this season. If Brandon Miller starts, if we just want to parlay this into a, what are the chances Brandon Miller starts anywhere question, which is yeah, yeah. theoretically anywhere from the two to the four, but I don't expect him to start at the four. So really you're not. looking at small forward and then you're looking at Gordon Hayward as a guy. Do you want to manage Gordon's minutes off of the bench? Then maybe Brandon sneaks into that three spot. But remember, of course, Miles Bridges is coming back. If you wanted to say Brandon would start the first 10 games while PJ Washington isn't on the roster, Gordon Hayward moves to that four. Brandon goes to three. Maybe that's a way that he starts. But Brandon is the only one that has a shot from the rookies. Hell, we were just asking about rotation minutes for Nick Smith Jr. He's not going to start. Brandon, if he does, I think it'll be more at the three. Yeah, totally. And I think it would be a situation where the team and Gordon get together, much like they did with Nick Batum before him, who they stretched in order to actually acquire Gordon Hayward. But in a situation similar to that, the team and the player come together and say, look, you're not part of our future. We've also got this other player who is part of our future. You know, we're, we're going to go another way with this. You know, but that's towards the end of the season. You know, when Gordon Hayward might not play altogether uh, because you, you tried to trade him at the deadline, you couldn't. And then now you're saying, OK, we're moving towards Brandon Miller. So Brandon Miller is going to be at the three now. That's a situation where I see him starting. I, I don't see it happening at the beginning of the year. They've got too many veterans. They've got playoff aspirations, so I think Clifford is going to lean on those veterans as much to the, dis- the dismay of a lot of Hornets fans. Uh, you're, you're probably yeah, not going to see. 
No, they won't be happy. Um, but if the if they make the playoffs, every, I think everybody's happy. If Brandon Miller's getting significant minutes off the bench and they and the Hornets make the playoffs, I think ultimately everyone will be happy because what would benefit Brandon Miller more than starting, as long as he's getting minutes, it's great. But benefiting him more than starting would be playoff experience. That's the problem with LaMelo. Like, LaMelo doesn't have any playoff experience because – you know, I, I think the team around him hasn't been good enough to get him that playoff experience. So, you know, hopefully they they make those roster decisions not based on trying to get Brandon Miller ready for year two or year three, but to actually get him playoff experience. That's what I would like to see. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Not only in the backcourt, but also out on the wing a little bit more. So maybe we ask more sicko satchel questions about that. Coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We still have more questions to rummage through, and then we'll give some finishing thoughts on a couple draft picks we did not speak about yesterday. We got to Brandon Miller, Nick Smith Jr. They, of course, needed all the attention after combining for 59 points. But what about James Najee? What about Amari Bailey? What do we think of their summer league so far? We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, I need to tell you about BetterHelp. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you're thinking about starting therapy, well, then give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And all you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And then you can even switch therapist anytime too for no additional charge. If you feel the need to do so, let therapy be your map with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's better help. H E L P betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA more locked on Hornets coming up next is locked on Hornets. Walker, sometimes you don't have to have the best package. Okay. Sometimes you just have to have the only package. If you wait, or this is a, if my dating life uh, taught me anything, sometimes you just have to wait around long enough until you're the only thing remaining. And then suddenly you look pretty great in comparison. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, Doug, hit us with some more sicko satchel questions. Give us some good ones. Give us a good one this one. Well, Tyler says, who is the backup shooting guard? So let's assume, just kind of bouncing off the discussion we had in segment one, if Terry's going to start at two, you've got a number of players that can compete hmm. for that backup shooting guard role. You've got Brandon Miller, who I think long-term is your, uh, is your answer at two. But you've also got Cody Martin. Hopefully the right twin this season. Hopefully he plays. Hopefully he's the available twin. And no, then you've the got Bryce twin McGowan's. Is huge. That's a big part. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and then you got Bryce McGowan's as well. It's it's a triple M situation. Uh, it's not just M and M. It's M and M and M in the backup shooting guard uh, battle here. Who do you got? Uh, yeah, I just think. I think more so Brandon Miller will be the backup three. I I'm really interested to see how many, how many two minutes that he's going to face because the idea, the advantage of Brandon Miller at the two is that he's big. And so that he can shoot over everybody. I don't, maybe that, maybe that will be something that you can look to exploit or use to your advantage in the backcourt. But he can also shoot over most small forwards, right? So I think that advantage is a little mitigated because it's not like he's going to have a problem. If he's going to shoot out on the perimeter, he'll be able to get a shot off against small forwards as well. If he's not as quick as some of the other options that you might have in the in, at the shooting guard spot, and Cody Martin probably is better defensively right now, then you put Cody Martin out there. And then you have Brandon Miller at the small forward coming off of the bench or starting if Gordon Hayward is the guy that is coming off of the bench while you try to manage his minutes. It won't be Nick Smith Jr. I, I think it'll be between Cody Martin and, and Brandon Miller a little bit, but I, I'm really interested to see what Steve Clifford sees in Brandon. I, I still think it's small forward, right? I, you'll see him play some backcourt. I'm not saying you'll, you'll never see him at the two, but if you're just going to who plays the second most minutes at the shooting guard spot behind Terry when everybody is available, I think Cody's probably going to play the most minutes at that spot. Yeah, and I'm not sure that those distinctions, shooting guard and small forward, are going to matter as much as they have in the past for the Charlotte Hornets because sure. this version of the front office has done a few things right. And I think one of the things that they've done right is target players like McGowan's and Amari Bailey and Brandon Miller that can play 
you know, a, a versatile style of defense that you can sort of play them at the two, you can play them at the three, you can go a little smaller, you can get a little bigger. There's There are many more options on this team than maybe there were in the past. They've kind of gone for this uh, particular type of player a lot in the draft. And so they've got options here. So really, I think it's it's a wing rotation now, more so than a 2-3 kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And so I think Miller will gobble up the most minutes ultimately. And I think you can you can see situations where he's playing alongside Hayward and Hayward is taking the better score, you know, defensively of of the two three matchup. Uh, and you can see uh, opportunities for him to play alongside maybe a McGowan's or or a Cody Martin, and, and Miller picks up because look if you're if you want to bet on something defensively for him, I think you bet on his quickness because you can't bet on his strength right now. Uh, maybe he puts on. Well, I just maybe, bet on his length more so than well, even yeah. his quickness. No, that's fine. That's, that's and, fine and too. Think, yeah. So, but you're not betting on a strength. So, I mean, if it's you know you're you're going to have to hide him a little bit from some of the if 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 he does play three. You've got to hide him a little bit. You might have to play him maybe with P.J. Washington in a bench rotation where P.J. is picking up the best wing scorer. And then you, you hide Brandon on maybe a, a four that plays out on the perimeter that, you know, he's not going to have to hang – that Brandon Miller's not going to have to hang with as much. Or whatever the defensive stopper is over there. That's just who Brandon Miller guards. And, and even in the backcourt, maybe if you have a shooting guard that is more of the – I don't know. I mean, because because that's the other way that you use his size in the backcourt is defensively. I was talking yeah. more offensively, but defensively, maybe you could use the length. I, I actually worry a little more about people driving by Brandon. The length will help. And so maybe even if you turn your hips a little bit and have to go with whoever drives by you, the length can help you, especially with Mark Williams, right? That, that'll help a lot. Just funneling everything into Mark Williams and then letting the guard be scared. So now you just have a whole bunch of arms coming at you. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a lot of length on this team with this pick and Brandon. He's going to have a lot of options, but he might be playing with Nick Richards. So, I mean, the, you know, that's the, yeah. that's the challenge for Clifford is balancing, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of these players to try to find lineups that are going to work together well. I was actually looking at some lineup data for the Charlotte Hornets last season. This is going to be part of something that I do for every HornetsBoxScore.com, by the way, if you want to subscribe, help me out. Um, I was looking at some lineup data from last year, and of the – of the 14 lineups that played around a hundred minutes, because there were two lineups that played 98, I counted them to uh, 98 possessions of the, of the 14 lineups that played around a hundred possessions last season. You want to take a guess at how many of them have had a positive points per possession differential, meaning they, they scored more points per possession than they gave up. Um, how many out of 14, only four lineups. And it wasn't the main starting lineup. You know, your Lamelo, Terry, Gordon Hayward, PJ Washington, Mason Plumlee. Yeah. That was a minus 1.8. It wasn't bad. It wasn't like, you know, atrocious or anything. It didn't get a ton of possessions mm -hmm. relative to what they would have gotten had Lamelo played more than 36 games. But not, not terrible. But a lot of those lineups were terrible. The four that were positive, two of them featured Jalen McDaniels at the two or paired with Kelly Oubre, two, three, wing positions. So you had length on the wing there for two of those positive ones. The other two featured Dennis Smith Jr. Yeah. And one of them was LaMelo and Dennis Smith Jr. So, you know, that was a plus five in 98 right. possessions. So I guess, you know, you can play a point guard with LaMelo Ball. It does fit. It does work. It was positive. Whatever. I'm not bitter. Anyway, my point is, in looking at that lineup data, <laughs> I'm banning myself from even mentioning his name. Okay, I'm not even going to say his name anymore because good people idea. just say, honestly because, I'm not people, gonna... because people in the comments just are, they, they just are like let it go, let it go. It's fine, you know. Okay, fine. I'm going to let it go. I'm not gonna even going to mention. It seems his name. like we're doing that right now. This is a good example. No, 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 no. Of that. I'm not. I'm not even going to say the point guard that now plays for Portland Trailblazers. I'm not going to say his name. Okay. Go anyway, ahead. the point of all that is that. Long term, Brandon Miller is going to be so good as a two next to LaMelo Ball because we've seen in lineup data that putting length at that two position or at the wing position, just having two guys that, that have length is a way for this team to generate positive outcomes. And, and But you got to have, de but you gotta have mean, defense I, I as well. Well, honestly, or or a Dennis Smith Jr. type. I mean, there there's two different examples there. So, right. But Cody, to me... 
he's not as good of a defender as Dennis Smith Jr. is. That's not what I'm saying. But you might even have a bit of a best of both world situation with Cody being more physical on the perimeter and also being 6'6". No, he's not 6'9", like Ben Miller. No, he doesn't have that length. But there were a couple of examples there that showed defensively. Because, yeah, Kelly Oubre had a good deflection rate last year. I don't know if anybody is calling him a, a stopper. You know, he's not an on-ball stopper, right? McDaniels was a really good team defender, in my opinion. Dennis Smith Jr. was amazing at the point of attack. Like, we know he had elite numbers all across the board, advanced stats would show. So, it, it's just, who does Steve Clifford want to roll with? Do you want to put length out there? Do you want to put Cody out there more so? To your point, it does allow maybe the idea of Brandon playing more too than we were talking about a little bit, even if we were still giving it a possibility. Well, and who's going to step up and provide? Is anyone going to step up and provide the on-ball pressure that Dennis Smith Jr. provided last season? Because now that's gone. You let that go for a minimum amount of money. I mean, it is seriously, I, I just don't understand it, why you would let Dennis Smith Jr. go to the Brooklyn Nets uh, for a paltry amount and lose something yeah. that that changed the calculus of games last season. <laughs> it changed the calculus when you were play, when you were doing algebra. <laughs> I mean, you were do, you know your offense your offense was so bad that the math out there was algebra and he was out there changing the calculus because his defense what was that impactful and and I don't know I don't see it on this roster right now. I don't know that they're going to add it. They may just have to, you know, they may just say, good luck, Steve, figure it out. Mark, yeah. good luck, Mark Williams, because you're going to be doing a lot more. You're going to be doing a lot more uh, helps help defense at the at the rim. It helps you. Um, well, speak, you, you mentioned the words right now, okay? So maybe we don't have this guy right now that can help in that role, but maybe in the future, there's this certain player that could help in that role. Coming up Ooh. next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Tease me! Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. What about Amari Bailey? Could he be that guy in the future, even if he can't do it his rookie season? We'll get to him and James Najee in just a moment. But not before I talk about Bird Dogs. You've seen Doug sport them on that there camera. They're fantastic. Bird Dogs make you look good. And because they look, uh, the reason they look good is because they have stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better and they fit way better than regular shorts that are made of this stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs use anti-stink, sweat, wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA or enter promo code locked on NBA for a free Yeti style tumbler. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NBA or promo code locked on NBA for a free Yeti uh, Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you one more segment to go locked on Hornets. This is locked on Hornets. Doug is wearing his sunglasses indoors at as we record 823 a.m. Doug, explain yourself. I am smothered in U.S. soccer. Came down to Charlotte to watch them as national team. Saw Jesus back-to-back -back Hattie. There's your soccer analysis for the day. Uh, but, yeah, you don't want to see these eyeballs. Okay, these eyeballs, these retinas have seen some things, if you will. And, uh, yeah, I'm recovering, and I'm doing my best here. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. I didn't realize that we were wearing uh, the same hat and the same shirt in that bump, but you picked the perfect one today. Nice job. Yeah, I was wearing the same exact shirt. Who knew? Uh, well, it's in honor of the U.S. men's national team. They were in San Diego, semifinals of the Gold Cup. They lost to Panama on uh, penalty kicks. My guy, Jesus, didn't have the hat. He <laughs> missed the penalty kick. You know when I'm not there, he just doesn't play as well. It's just that's. But that's you're not fact. bitter. You're not bitter at all. You're you're moving on. Just well, like no. In. Listen, that's the B team. Uh, for here's your soccer analysis for the day. That was the B team. Essentially, there are a few guys on that squad that are going to play in the World Cup in 2026, uh, but that was mostly B teamers out there playing Panama. So you know, okay, they find they don't they don't go to the Gold Cup final. Whatever, they're going to regroup. They've got uh, a lot of years here to get ready for this Gold Cup and get the A team together. Um, are the Hornets summer league team, are they going to be playing for any kind of cup or are they going to be going home after this? <laughs> no. no gold cup, <laughs> no silver cup, no, no bronze cup. 
No. Uh, no None of that. sterling silver cup. Yeah. It, it's no it's maybe a coffee foil cup. cup with a broken handle. It's it's <laughs> it's whatever it is, it's broken. Okay. No copper cup. Now, you know, this we, we no have diet some coke can cup. All right. Yeah. You you got any more? You good. No, I, I would I would, give me all the bad cups to win. All of the bad ones. No coffee um, cup. With the with the brown ring at the bottom because you haven't washed it in a while. Yeah, just rinse it out. All you have to do is rinse it out after you're done. Rinse it out and you're good. I'm sorry. You I'm sorry. It. You sound like you sound like producer Katie. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm a little it's, busy. It's it's really easy. Yeah, annoyance. wine glasses too. All you have to do is just rinse it out, and you don't have the red <laughs> ring around it. But I'm fine. I'm not bitter. This is just a not bitter show, Doug. We're all fine. Okay, I'm fine. Anyway, um, the Charlotte Hornets summer league team. We know they have not won a game yet. There are some people that were upset about that some mm. despite brandon clearly playing the best he ever has in summer league mm -hmm. despite Nick oh, Smith upset Jr. about upset you're saying they are upset that they didn't win that game against Portland. well i mean you have yeah the whole win one for the culture right like come on it, it's who cares no. who cares i i want good perform the part of the reason that summer league was so bad yes you'd like to win i'm not i'm not discounting that but the storyline is not the loss against Portland. The storyline is play well. playing the best and Nick Smith Jr. going for over 30 points. Right. So that's the storyline. Um, now, I think all of the draft picks showed out. I mean, we had the rookie takeover yesterday. Clearly, it was Nick Smith Jr. and Brandon Miller leading the story. But what do you think about Amari Bailey and James Najee out there performing as well? I've loved what I've seen out of Amari Bailey. I think defensively, he actually projects better for me than Bryce McGowan's. Offensively, oh, yeah. it's agree. a different story. Uh, the, he needs a lot of work. He needs a shot doctor. Uh, Kreitzer is going to have to get in with Bailey and figure some stuff out because that shot looks super wonky. Uh, but but love the hustle, love the length, love the Doc Ock arms that stretch out and, and grab basketballs out of nowhere, pick them out of passing lanes, take them back, transition dunks. Love what I've seen out of Bailey. Najee, too. I mean, defensively, I love the movements. Uh, I love the shot blocking. He's physical. I, I think he needs to work on finishing some plays. That may be rooted in what we've talked about before with the speed of the game and the intensity and, the, and what they ask you to do in terms of running up and down the court being different from Euro League yeah. than it is in the NBA. Because the Euro League is super physical. Like guys really, they get bodies on bodies and it's mostly a game that is played on the ground and not up in the air and not running back, you know, not a ton of transition in Euro league. Right. So like NBA is totally different story. So maybe he'll be better at finishing those plays as he gets his sort of NBA uh, lungs together. Uh, but I've liked what I've seen out of Najee. Well, I mean, Wimby said that exact same thing. They asked him about the difference between the NBA and playing overseas. <clears throat> and he talked about it being less physical here in the NBA. And also, Wimby's tired. I mean, he got fatigued. There was that conversation about him because it's yeah. just a different style. And so you have to be in some kind of in, in a different type of condition because, you know, it, it's not it's not like James Najee is eating cheeseburgers this offseason. It's not like Wimby is just chilling on the couch. It's just that it's a complete different style, even for – seven four seven five top prospect or the 31st prospect or the 31st guy taken that's a lot more solid but also still seven feet doesn't matter what body type just the conditioning isn't there uh, not true for amari you know he's running around all over the place which is a lot of fun he, he do you was ready. like do you like that by the way do you like the idea that the nba Wimby also said it's easier to score in the NBA than it is in Euro League. Although he's Probably never played, which is weird yeah. for him to say because he's only played summer league. It's like Wimby, it might get a little bit different when you get to the when you get to the NBA. But well, yeah, and he scored and he didn't have a good first game too. Which right. yeah, but, but. So it's like, hold on, well, you know, well, you know, let's let's but maybe hold hold off on those comments. But what what do you think about that idea though? Because I he's probably not the first Euro League guy to think that. I mean, you know, obviously Luca uh, is is much more free to score in uh the nba than he was when he was playing in euro league so like look how physical he is i mean that's his game well he's got a, he, well he certainly has a lot of physical <laughs> he's, he's a beefy boy 
Well, no, he is, but that that's how he gets to the rim a lot, right? Yeah. Like he's just getting there. He's just mashing his entire time getting to the goal defensively. Sure. He's not good, but offensively, that's how he plays. I think it makes sense. If the NBA is going to be comprised of the best athletes on the planet that play basketball. And so in order to use that athleticism to your advantage, yes, a lot of that is strength, but also a lot of that is just beating guys down the floor, especially with advanced stats pointing to more possessions is a good thing. Three point shooting is a good thing. So if you don't have those athletes, not to yeah. that level playing overseas, and you also don't have it as spread out, then you're almost playing in a phone booth to give you some good old football right. coach speak. They're playing in a phone booth over there. And and look, and th this isn't, this isn't me you know, scouting the leagues overseas, you know, religiously, right? Like that's not what I'm doing, but it does make sense in that regard of, yeah, you know, this is what the NBA is and this is what they're comprised. But do you of. like that? Do you like that? The NBA has really transitioned from the sort of peak uh, bar room brawl that was the nineties into what it is today, which is an entirely different game, which is up and down. Everybody's rip Hamilton. Now you have to be rip that rip Hamilton level of running back and forth uh, you know, uh, all around the court looking for opportunities. And and it is much less physical. The hand checking's gone. I mean, do you like that? Yeah, I, I think it's totally fine. There are a lot of people that will discuss the 90s being the best era. It was a lot of fun. You had a whole lot of, I, I mean, especially with the Charlotte Hornets. You know, everybody loves to go back to the grandmama days. I mean, we reference it once a week and it was 30 years ago <laughs> i mean that's yeah. that's just how it is or it was 20 years ago on the bet and the the later part of the good stages right we still like that but the product i mean you know yes they might have played defense is what you're saying they're still playing defense it's just that guys are so skilled you have to be skilled everywhere man i mean at least it's something you know if, if you can't shoot then you have to be able to move your feet on the perimeter be a dive guy that can also jump you know, with a 40 inch vertical, it's just yeah. what these guys can do these days. It's freaking ridiculous, man. So yes, I, I, I have no problem with the way the game has evolved. I, I well, really don't. It, it, they do still play defense. It's just different. Yeah. It, it's, it's now so much team defense and everybody playing together and everybody understanding, you know, that half step that they can't take towards the basket or the half step that they can't give up for the closeout and everybody communicating. It's why you value talking. It's why you value intelligence. Guys that really understand, you know, def defense is not about how much of a beating can you take. It's really m much more about how much of a, you know, mind bleep can you take because these offenses are trying to just confuse you and get you to take that half step in a direction that they want you to take so that they can expose you and get to the rim. And so that's the adjustment that Brandon Miller has to make. But the style of game – that is played right now, I think makes you feel better about taking a guy like Brandon Miller because it is so much about length and being able to shoot over guys and, and, and being able to use that to your advantage. And so when we talk about Brandon Miller getting stronger, he certainly needs to do that. But it's not like we're asking him to transform his body into like Andre Iguodala or, or just like a, a guy that's like super strong yeah, I don't think that's where Brandon Miller has to get to, um, but he does have to get a little bit stronger, but he doesn't have to, you know, take the same beating that guys would have taken in, in the 1990s. So anyway, I just thought it was an interesting conversation uh, really quickly on Najee. I know you love him. You think he should be the starting center. Uh, so I just wanted to give you some time. For the to all really... NBA team, just get it, <laughs> just get it clear. I think he's the top, I think he's the top five center in the league right now. So, but you know, it, it is confusing for us to say, you know, maybe he needs, another year in Barcelona uh, before he comes back over here. If we're also saying that the style of play is significantly different than what he would face in the NBA or even the swarm, like the swarm are going to play way different than Barcelona. Yeah. Um, so how do you, how do you square that circle? I don't, I don't know what's best for his development, to be quite honest with you. If he wants to go over to Barcelona, that's great. There was a lot of conversation about him starting, but then they just brought in former Hornet Billy Hernan Gomez. So it looks like he's going to be the starting center for Barcelona. So, you know, Billy! Defensive, yes, Billy. D defensively, we know Najee is better than Billy. Billy is an outstanding <laughs> rebounder. That's the way that he makes it in the NBA. He is an outstanding rebounder. Defensively, he is really bad Najee is going to be like I look I said that he was the second best defensive center on this roster right now for the Hornets 
I know that he's better than Billy in Barcelona. We've seen that, but I love Billy. His rebounding's great. On this team, Mark Williams is a very, very good defensive prospect. You could easily see him, you know, grabbing a couple of all NBA selections. Rim protection is great. We see him scare guards into making wrong decisions, driving out of the paint. I can't wait to see what Mark is going to do in his second year. With Nick Richards, there's some rim protection numbers that can be there, you know, like field goal percentage for the other team when shooting against him. Those numbers aren't bad. Um, I, they're they're on the high end with some of the cleaning the glass efficiency stuff on that end. But on the perimeter, we know it's not nearly as good. Nick Richards, I think as far as the discipline goes, it's not good at all. Nick Richards will foul you. If we're talking about Nick Richards, remember the Steve Clifford quote where Nick Richards is physical and Mark Williams is, is the smart defender? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, even so, is Nick more physical than Najee is? I, I beg to differ on that one. So yeah, that it's it's not it doesn't mean that Najee should be the backup center because offensively he's not better than Nick Richards. Nick Richards mm-hmm. is a really good offensive rebounder, one of the best in the league, given what we've seen this past season, especially because he improved so much. Nick Richards should still be the backup center, right? He should still get minutes, and Najee is still getting DNP CDs. But defensively, I think very highly of him. I, I think that there are not a lot of things that you can do in a realistic scenario for Najee to be uncomfortable in a few situations. If he's going to have to guard Kyrie Irving out at the at the top of the key, then yeah, he'll get driven by. But in the most likely scenarios of guarding, you know, can he stay in front of threes on pick and rolls? He can hedge, he can drop, he can contest at the rim, he can make you think out in the short corner, do I need to pass? Can I get the shot up? Oh wait, no, I I don't know what to do. I'll just turn it over. Yeah, I I think he's really, really good defensively, and I'm really excited to see what he'll do. And you have to make a call. I mean, if you are going if you are going to send him back to Barcelona because you don't think there are going to be enough minutes for him or or you think, you know, it, it would just be better financially not to have to figure that out, then you've got to figure something out. Uh, and there's not there aren't a ton of names left on the kind of free agency list. I mean, Biz is sitting there if you want to do a third Biz reunion. I don't know if he's been picked up yet, uh, but I know he was on the list. Serge Ibaka, Dwayne Dedman, Boban, Nerlens Noel, Yurtsevin, Tristan Thompson. I mean, that, none of these names are like jumping yeah. out at me. Gorgie Jang, Noah Vonley still out there. If you want to do a reunion with Noah Vonley, is he still playing? Goodness gracious! Uh, well, yeah, he's still he's still hanging there out he there. Is. So there's his name at least. So yeah, I mean, not a, not a ton of options out there. So what is that? What does that third center look like? Uh, it, uh, unless it's Kai Jones, you know, unless you just really feel confident that this is, the, you know, he he would get that opportunity. But then you're you're one injury away from playing significant minutes with Kai Jones at the center. I think that that could uh, that could hurt your playoff chances. <laughs> we saw it last year. We saw it last year. Kai Jones was asked to do quite a bit because of all the injuries. Last thing I'll say as we talk about Bailey and Najee, these are the defensive prospects that you feel good about, right? I mean, offensively, both of them are weaker in that area than they are on the other end of the floor. We wanted some balance to the force. We wanted some defense. And you got a couple guys that look like they can be pretty damn good on that end. Brandon Miller showing some flashes, been very up and down. There's been some really bad defensive games, in my opinion, from him. But there's also been some great stretches. The chase down block that he had is one of the best highlights. You know, he, he does show a lot of effort. He'll get bumped off his spot. But and, and Nick Smith Jr. hasn't shown a ton of defense, in my opinion. I mean, he I think Najee was, you know, saving him a lot, right? Like anybody that would get driven by Najee was there style. to contest. Yeah, he's a turnstile. Yeah. So but but Brandon is not a turnstile. I would absolutely not call him that. So, yeah, no. it's, it's nice to have some defensive prospect here in this draft with uh, with the four guys you brought in. So that's cool to see. All right, that'll do it. That's Locked On Hornets. We got one more uh, episode to go this week. We'll recap that episode or the game, I guess, tonight against the Pelicans, who has Jalen Crutcher. So watch out for him again. Um, And then you can see some of the other guys on the roster, too. Um, This is like silly season summer league style because it's like two-way contract guys now. You know, like I, I wonder if the Pelicans are going to be resting anyone at well, this point. Well, just do your just do your health rain dance. Like, do your health dance. Make sure everybody stays healthy. Yeah. You know, that's that that is the one benefit to them losing all of these summer league games is that they don't have to play two more of them uh, or one more or two more or <laughs> three more. Benefit. Yeah, I mean, you the don't. I mean, it's all. This more. is all at this point. It's all Russian roulette. You know, yeah. I mean, you're just hoping that nobody gets injured. So that's all I'm. That's all I want to see is everyone stay healthy. I'd love to see Brandon Miller. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, follow up that performance with another efficient performance. Uh, you know, maybe come out of the gates. First quarter, I want to see him, you know, making good decisions because I thought even in that game where a lot of great stuff happened for Brandon, he started with two plays where he looked out of sorts. So I just want to see from the jump, and I want to see harder closeouts. You talk about defense for Brandon Miller being a little wishy-washy. I want to see him make some hard closeouts. That's that's what annoyed me in that last game. I thought his closeouts were a little soft. And uh, and stay healthy, as you mentioned. Yeah, big, strong NFL training camp vibes. Just get out of there healthy as much as possible. That'll do it. Thanks for making us your first listen. Catch us anywhere you get your pods. Make your second listen game to game NBA every moment. Every top performance, every result. Again, catch that podcast wherever you get your pods. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.